preach from the book of Jeremiah, or at least start there. Jeremiah 29, we've heard this before. It's a very important verse and verses of the Bible. So let me begin reading there in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know, God says through the prophet Jeremiah, the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. It is indeed a lamp unto my feet, a light unto our path, God. It is a mighty hammer that breaks the hard places of our heart in pieces so that you can move us again toward you you and your will. Thank you, Lord. It's like a sword that pierces, and that pain is a good pain because it helps us to see, Lord, our error and correct our ways. And it is like a fire, God that burns away all the impurities of our life. So thank you for your word. May your word have free course in our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said amen and amen. I want to share about hunger for God. In this brand new year, some of us are looking at things of the past and things of the present. I hope all of us are looking deeply on the inside and, and asking God to reveal, are there things in my life, are there things in my heart that should not be there? And time of fasting and prayer for me is always that way, at least it has been in recent years and certainly this year, because I, I find things that I kind of cover over and that I have to, I have to get rid of uh, if I'm going to really walk with God, if my heart is really going to be steady and faithful to him. Israel was no different. In fact, they're our example or the lack of example in some cases when it comes to their hunger for God. Israel's captivity, and he speaks, Jeremiah speaks to them in their captivity at this stage in his writing of the book of Jeremiah. And it's just one of the saddest books you would ever want to read, but it's chalked full of words like this, God's love and intention for his people. And Israel, their captivity in Babylon certainly was of their own making. It was of their own making. For the most part, the whole nation for decades and even hundreds of years had turned their heart, and sometimes they would come back and and there would be some recouping, but there was never this consistency that is needed when it comes to serving God. And certainly as a nation, they failed in many ways. But they were also times, as I said, where they turned their heart to God. But at this time, stage in Israel's history, they were already in captivity in Babylon. There, were a, there was a remnant that was remaining. But it was basic, basically because their heart had grown cold and their service to God had, had waned and become less than what it should have been and what it needed to be in order for them to maintain a hunger and a thirst and a desire to know him. And so they walked away from God. They raised up idols in their own heart and in, their, in the temple there in Jerusalem for hundreds of years. And God was very patient. And God would send deliverers and God would help them. But it was sad that they had gone into captivity. And so with this passage, with this word from Jeremiah, And anytime you look at the Word of God, you must put yourself in the Word of God or it becomes some principle for someone else. 
if I do not put myself in the passage and see what the heart of God is for me, then, I, then the word of God will have no effect. I can learn things, but it will not affect my heart. And so this is, this is what a pastor does. He helps you to feed on and get the word of God in you so that you can see what his light is shining on. And so the question is, what is the Lord saying? What is the Lord saying to them in their captivity? Yes, we have to take it in context. We have to take the word in context, what it means to the people he's speaking to, and we understand that by the history. We can read it in the Bible. But what is he saying to me? What is he saying about my life and my heart in distress? And they were in distress of their own making. They were in prolonged trial. The Bible says that they were captive for 70 years. God never intended that to happen. But because of their hardness of heart and their obstinance, they sunk down into a desperate place and they became captive in Babylon. What is he saying to me, though, as well in discouraging circumstances that feel like captivity and certainly in hardness of heart that is definitely captivity. Believe me, their captivity started long before they went into Babylon. Their captivity started in their heart. And so you have to be very, very aware of what your heart is doing and saying and what it feels like and what's happening there. And your heart is simply your, the very center of your being that no one else sees. No one else sees what's really in my heart, but God does. God does. And so I have to be very aware of what's happening in here and in here in order to resist hardness of heart and remain pliable and teachable and humble in the sight of the Lord. And that's not easy for any of us. And so he's saying to Israel, I have a set time. He says, I'm going to visit you. If you read this whole chapter, and it's powerful, he says, I'm going to visit you. Hallelujah. I may want a visit from God. I, I, want, it, I want it every day. And so, uh, but they were going to be visited by God, and God was going to turn the heart of the Babylonian king and bring them back to Israel where they would reestablish the worship of God for their nation. They were going to establish temple worship the way it was designed to be. And so God said, I'm going to visit you. But for us, if I'm going to put myself in the context, for me, the Bible tells me today is the accepted time. Today is the day of his saving power. This is the moment that God chooses to interact with us each and every day. And so it's important for us to accept that time and believe that today is the accepted time and respond appropriately. To Israel, I'm going to deliver them, God says, and bring them back. To any one of us who turn to him in this hour, you may be going through some real distress. You may have some hard places in your heart that you need to submit to God. But God is always saying things like he said here through Jeremiah, and he is going to restore you. This is God's heart. He will restore you. He will establish you. He will give you what he has always had in his heart for you, and that is goodness and peace and prosperity, a hope and a future. So what is he asking of Israel? See, this is the simple part, and yet it seems absolutely hard to do when we have distractions in our lives. He's asking of Israel and of any of us, you who are in captivity, whether it be in the heart or you feel in circumstances of some sort, he says this, seek me. Find me. See, some people say, well, I saw it and I really didn't. You know, nothing really changed. No, you seek until you find. 
you go after God until the breakthrough happens. Because you know what your condition is. Israel knew what their condition was. They were in captivity. And so he's asking us to seek and to find him. But you can only do it. This is the condition. When you do so with all your heart. Now, some of you may feel distant from God. Have you ever felt distant from God? You don't have to raise your hand. There are times in our life where we do. But you're here today. Amen. You're here. And there is something on the inside of you and me that longs as Christians, and even when we were not Christians before we came to Christ, that longs for closeness with God. See, closeness and intimacy can only come alive and stay alive in your heart when you and I decide to seek and find Him. Seek and find Him with hungry, longing hearts for Him. Now, the word hunger, we all know it, and some of us are going through this right now because you are hungry, you're going through a fast, and it's okay. Look at your neighbor and say, it's okay to feel hungry. It's okay. But hunger is that empty, gnawing ache on the inside of you that senses a, a need, a, a need for uh, something to fill it on the inside. Hunger for God is, is very similar to that physical hunger. It is an active desperation of the soul. An active desperation of the soul. Say that with me. It is an active desperation of the soul. Seeking out God as the object of desire that He alone can satisfy. That's it. That's hunger for God. Hunger for God is the longing to encounter Him to be filled and surrounded with Him, embraced by Him in every circumstance of life. And through the prophet Jeremiah, God Himself promises this. God promises this, that all those who hunger in their heart for Him faithfully, hunger faithfully, consistently, afresh, day by day, He says this. He says, you will seek and find me. When you seek for me with all your heart. So that, that phrase, all your heart, all, think about this, all your heart. Now there's a lot going on in your heart. That is the very seat of your intelligence. That's your mind, your will, your emotions, all, all of it, all of you. All of your past, all of your present, all of your hopes, all your dreams. It's all going on right here in your heart. All, God says. And this was a great commandment too, to love God, not with some of your heart, but all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. Think of that. That is the, one of the greatest challenges of your heart and of your life. You think raising kids was hard. Some of you are still going through it. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Little Leo, I know. Adoption is awesome. Adoption is the option. Hallelujah. All your heart is a challenge. It's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for most of us. The Bible speaks of the heart. It speaks of the heart. How desperately wicked it is. How sinful it is. How dark how divisive and how depraved it really is. It talks of a divided heart, how our hearts can go in different directions. One day we have a loyalty, the next day we don't. This is the human heart we're talking about here, that God is demanding and he wants and desires. And by the way, he gives us strength and power now through the Holy Spirit to do this with all of our heart. He's speaking about all of our heart. The Bible talks about the divided heart and how it brings ruin. A kingdom divided against itself it falls. 
it falls into ruin. A heart divided against itself will fall into ruin. It talks about a double-minded man. How he is unstable in all of his ways, unsound and unsteady. And so that one of the greatest challenges of this new year is not how much money you're going to make. You know how well you can perform in the business world. You know what your finances look like. But it's how well you can keep your heart burning for God. And so with all of this depravity in our heart, thank goodness for the the born-again experience. Thank goodness for the cleansing of sins by His blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for all that he has done to regenerate and renew our relationship and reconcile ourselves with him, but we still have this challenge. And if you and I can rise to this challenge and maintain a place, listen, God gave this phrase to me, an urgent, in, an urgent intimacy, an urgent intimacy with God, an urgent intimacy every day through humble seeking of him, through talking to him and walking with him and involving him in your daily life. It's not hard. It's a a choice that I make. I'm not going to resist. I'm going to welcome. And I'm going to allow him to work in my life. I'm going to ask him to do so. You will discover when you do this, this urgent intimacy, this hunger of heart, you'll discover afresh the creator of the universe. You will discover how good God is, how much he loves, how much his power is efficacious in your life and the purpose of your existence. That's what happens when you do this. All God's people have the power to pursue God. Every single one of us. And every single one of us can know his heart, know his thoughts and his desires and his will. All it takes is a willingness to say, Lord, you have my heart. You have it all. You correct what you want to correct. You do what you want to do. If I make mistakes, if I say the wrong thing, if I have the wrong attitude, Lord, help me to be quick to come back to you. Now, why is this important? You know, people... People can pretend to have a relationship with God, and they can fool a lot of people, but we can't fool God. The reason why God is asking for the hearts of the people of Israel and ours today is because it can grow cold. Our heart can grow cold toward him, toward his will, toward his work. The things of God can fall into disrepute. The temple fell into idol worship. Anything You know, the devil is always active. He is always going after territory in your life. He's always encroaching, but you have to resist him. It's because we can grow not only cold, but worse yet, lukewarm. Lukewarm is even, you know, we think we're okay, but we're really not. We know we're compromising, and so God says you're not hot nor cold in the book of Revelation. Without daily desiring to know and to please him. That is hunger for God. Not only that, it's important. And why it's important to maintain this urgent intimacy with God. Not only to keep from growing cold, but but God is always doing new things. He's always doing something fresh. This new year is a new challenge for our church. We went through a lot. Now we're going to see what God does. Hallelujah. We're going to see all the good things that God does. What the enemy intended for evil, God's going to turn around for our good and his glory. He's going to do fresh things for me. I mean, I've been through things like this before. This is no different. People have gone through hard times. Churches have suffered. But thanks be to God that he is the builder of the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's doing fresh things. That's why it's important. We can't let our hearts grow cold because of disappointment, adversity. But we must prevail because he is revealing things today that we have to do to become even more fruitful, better at what we do, more loving, more kind. He is 
in this present age, he is wanting us to engage. It's very important to maintain a heart of fervency and urgent intimacy because he wants his people present. He wants his people engaged. He wants us to be willing and he wants us doing the things that he has planned. So some of the greatest tragedies in biblical and Christian history have happened due to a loss of faithful hunger. Let me say that. A loss of faithful hunger in pursuit of God, in pursuit of his will, in pursuit of intimacy with him and his blessing. And Samson is one of those stories. Samson was born with a destiny on his life. His destiny was to be a deliverer for Israel. And as a Christian, you and I are born, and we are born again with a destiny on our lives. Again, you have to put yourself in the context. And so the Bible tells us in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistine for 40 years. That's a long time. And this is what hardness of heart does. It leads us to places we don't want to go. But if we will will push away from it and resist it, oh, the blessing and the glory of it. Oh, and so Manoah, Samson's father, and Manoah's wife, who was barren, had an angelic visit. And this was powerful. You can read about it. In fact, it was two visits. The angel showed up to Manoah's wife and told her that she was going to have a child. He was going to be a deliverer. And boom, he vanished. When she came back to tell her husband, they ran out. The angel was gone. And so Manoah prayed, God, give me another visitation. How many want another visitation? God will always meet you at your place of hunger. Can I say that again? God will always meet you at your place of hunger. Manoah was waiting. He prayed, and the angel showed up again. Same place, same kind of way. And this time, his wife said, hold on, stay here. Let me go get my husband. And so she did. They ran out. Manoah saw the angel. They they spoke to the angel. The angel told them of the promise. They fed the angel. I didn't know angels could eat human food, but they do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And suddenly the fire of God, the angel went up into the smoke and then back into heaven. You can read the whole story. It's powerful. And so Samson grew, the Bible says. Manoah's wife gave birth. The child grew. Samson grew. And the Lord blessed him. Listen to this. The Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of God began to move upon him at the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. There are, there are times early on, there were times in your life and mine where God moved powerfully. you got to get it back, hallelujah. you got to maintain that. God wants to do great things in your life. Samson had a very good start. His heart was toward God faithfully. The Spirit of God was upon him and moved through him, and he did great exploits. But, but Samson got distracted. His heart began to turn in the wrong direction. Instead of turning to God, he now began to turn toward a distraction. He started coveting other things uh, and lost his way, forsook his faithful, undivided heart for God. And instead of becoming a great deliverer, Samson became a great tragedy of the Bible and a sad example to all of us. And this could happen to any of us. It happens to pastors all the time. It happens to Christians all the time. Their families are left in ruin because somebody didn't maintain a faithful, uh, uh, sturdy, strong uh, heart for God. Samson's distractions were not to be compared. This is the sad part. They were not to be compared with the glory that God had planned for him. The things that God plans for you and the things that are distracting you Listen, those things that are distracting you are not to be compared with what God has planned for you. His lust for women, his lust for fame, his bantering with and, and sharing riddles with the Philistine enemies. 
in their camp, wanting admiration from them for their for his feats of strength. And his, most of all, his lack of hunger in his heart to live for the Lord caused his downfall. And in his weakened spiritual state, guess what happened? Samson was easily deceived. Easily deceived by Delilah, a Philistine woman. Somebody that the Bible forbade him to marry. He lost his anointing, was blinded by the Philistines and put in prison. This is a sad tragedy. I'm talking about hardness of heart. I'm talking about hunger in your heart and maintaining it. What precious things could we lose if we do not maintain our hunger? What, what precious things do we jeopardize by being drawn away from our faithful heart for God and his will for our life? Your calling, your destiny, your relationship with God and with others. I've seen marriages break up because of hardness of heart. I've seen children go astray because of hardness of heart. These are things that are dangerous. And so in this new year, we have to make sure that we either maintain or recapture this fervency of heart on the inside for God. Now, believe me when I say it, I like to laugh and joke and have fun and do all those things too. But those things cannot become distractions. They cannot become idols in my life. My heart always turns to God. Everything has to be filtered through my relationship with God. Everything through the filter of God's word. And so, how do you stir up hunger in your heart for God? Everybody say amen. Tell me, pastor. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to give you four things real quick. Are you ready? Number one, repent. Repentance should be Things that we do all the time, by the way. Change our mind, change our attitude. If our attitude's bad, you change your mind about it, get back to the right attitude. But repentance is a very, very powerful tool, a very, very powerful key. Your mindset and undivided heart matter to God. Repent, repentance. It's the message of mercy from God. It is a message of mercy. When Jesus came, he spoke it. Repent, every one of you, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 1 says this, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Without repentance, your hard, unrepentant heart, my hard, unrepentant heart, will prevent me from entering into kingdom anointing, kingdom power, kingdom blessing, the kingdom of God. It will prevent me. The Bible says your heart and my heart is at war with God until we repent and acknowledge our sinful heart and ask God to cleanse us and have mercy on us. That's the born-again experience. Acts 3.19 tells us this, repent, therefore, and be converted. Repent and be converted. There's a change that takes place in your thought life, in your heart, and in your behavior, that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing, everybody say that with me, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Somebody say amen. This is, this is what keeping a, a heart and a hunger for God does. The children of Israel in the wilderness, and we, we, see, we see through the Bible, I preached on this on Wednesday uh, in my message uh, from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. You remember how God delivered Israel out of Egypt? And instead of being thankful, instead of thanking God and praising Him consistently for His deliverance, Israel tested God. They were ungrateful. You know, I said it on Wednesday. Sometimes I get, you know, we're just dissatisfied with everything. You just every you ever feel that way? You just aren't satisfied with anything. Nobody can satisfy you. And you gotta you gotta check out of that stuff. It is bad attitude. We have to be sure that we stay humble before God. But Israel tested him, tried, provoked him. 
for 40 years in the wilderness. That 40 years seems to come up quite a bit, doesn't it? How? How did they provoke him? Hardness of heart. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, today, everybody say today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me. Listen to this. I could just feel the heart of the father breaking tried me and saw my works for 40 years. What was he doing? He was providing water. He was providing food, quail, manna, protection. He was delivering them, keeping them safe. A cloud by day from the sun, fire by night to keep them warm. Oh my, was God not good even in the wilderness? Therefore, I was angry with that generation. said, they always go astray. Where? In their heart. And they have not known my ways. I spoke about this again on Wednesday. You got to hear this. I went into depth. Uh, and you can, you can find it on our podcast and on our YouTube channel. So I swore in my wrath, God said, that they shall not enter my rest. That's the real key. That's the benefit. The, the peace of God is invaluable. The peace of God in my heart, no matter what's going on around me, no matter what is circling in my mind or in my life. The peace of God is a rock. You enter into rest when you have a hunger for God. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily. This is why it's so important to come to church. This is why it's so important to be around people who encourage you in your relationship with God. You will not survive unless others are encouraging you in your relationship with God. You cannot survive unless you hear the word of God preached among the brethren. It stirs you. It breaks the hard places up. It sets fires on the inside of you. It pierces on the inside. It discerns and helps you get rid of the old and in with the new things of God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, hallelujah, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Amen. Steadfast to the end means you've got to keep a burning flame on the inside. It may, it, you know, anybody love campfires? I love campfires. We have a little, little thing out on our deck that we'll do in the fall. But it'll go out unless I'm stoking it with new wood. It'll go out. It'll last a while. It'll last all night. It could last weeks until it finally ends and goes out, the fire, the flame. you got to stoke it. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Repent. If you feel any hardness at all. And by the way, coming into this fast, I was not happy. I mean, I was feasting so well. Hallelujah. My wife, uh, you know, for my birthday, she will fix my favorite meal that will last days. And... And, you know, the week before the fast, oh, I was feasting. Oh, and cookies, cakes, and birthday parties, and celebrations. Man, were we feasting or what? It was amazing. And so I just came kicking and screaming almost into this fast, dragging myself in here on that first day of January. But I knew I needed it. I knew my heart needed it. I knew the things that were going on in my mind and in my heart. I knew how the enemy is trying to wax over my heart and make it hard by things that have happened, things that people have said, uh, things that I've gone through, and memories, all of it, you know, or, or just the hopelessness. I don't know if things are going to change. You know how it is. I'm a human being just like you are. Some of you feel like you're in a dead-end job. This is not a dead-end job for me. This is a vocation and a calling that I'm happy to do. But I'm just trying to relate to you. So you, there's these things that, that try to harden our heart and times of fasting and prayer. I'll never forget it. The second day. It was just the second day of the fast. 
I'm laying on my face. I don't even want to lead the prayer meeting. I have no desire to, I said, God, I don't want to lead the prayer meeting tonight. I just want to be with you. I got to hear from you. I got to have answers. You got to melt some of this stuff that have gathered, that's gathered on my heart this past year. It's gathered there. I see it. It's real. I don't want it. God, help me. Help me, Lord. You know, he met me right here. Right here, he met me. And he began his precious work on my heart afresh and anew, and he just melted it away. It was because I sought him with all of my heart. I sought him. I found him. He found me where I was supposed to be. Somebody say amen. And so, repent. This leads me to my next point. How to stir up hunger in your heart. I'll go through these next three quickly, maybe. Return. Everybody say return. Return. With all of your heart. Repent with all of your heart. Return with all of your heart. Your actions and your associations matter to God. Samson's actions and associations, his heart, of course, caused him great harm in the end. Samson's return to God, and this was so fascinating to me as I just studied it again with this in mind, hunger for God. His return to God was not like his public feats of strength, known and renowned in the region as a mighty man, an anointed man that you just don't mess with. His pride, boasting, all of it. His return to God was not like that. It was not like that at all. In fact, it was the very opposite. Samson's return was was quiet and personal and real on the inside of him. He was alone in the prison cell of the Philistines. Samson's repentance and return, no doubt, was with many tears and much regret. In his physical blindness, in his physical darkness, what began to happen in his life is fascinating to me. It tells me that God does not give up on us in our backslidden condition. He does not give up in our hardness of heart. What began to happen in his blindness and darkness was that the light of the world, the God of his salvation, began to dawn in his soul, and hunger for obedience to God grew. It grew. It germinated in secret. You see, the mystery of regeneration is not not announced abroad. The secret of returning and and refreshing ourselves in the Lord is not an outward thing. It is an inward thing. This renewal, this regeneration, this being reborn by the Spirit of God initially and being washed by the Spirit of God daily in the Word is such that it's a place that no one else sees but you and God alone. And Samson returned to the Lord and found his place in his Savior once again, and no one knew it. He wasn't doing feats of strength. It would seem like he would be able to rip the bars off the prison, go in and just slay people and walk out of that prison. Oh, no, it wasn't that way. Samson was blind now, and he did not know the way out. And so God began to return to Samson, the anointing. Notice this in Judges 16. I love this, verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them 
one on his right and one on his left. Then Samson said, and he said this to the Lord, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with, his, with all his might. And the temple fell on the Lord's and on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. What a tragic victory. What a tragic story. God intended him to be a deliverer. What kind of hardness of heart causes someone to fall to that kind of, and never realize their full potential? I'd say it happens all the time. And we have power over it. That's the good thing. Return to God. Associate with his people, with his cause, like missions. What better, what, what better way to spend your money and send your money and give your money than missions? Somebody say amen. We should be giving more to missions than we've given in our lifetime. Refuse the attractions of the world and pursue the will of God. Return. Repent and return. Number three, this is how you turn, stir up hunger in your heart. Repent, return, and renew. Somebody say amen. Renew your devotion and your determination. It matters to God. Whenever a new king in Israel uh, prece- or, or came after a, a very, very bad king who raised up idols, the new king, if he was good and, and pursued God, would tear down the old idols. He would, he would remove them. He would, he would break them up and destroy them if he was doing what was right in the sight of God. And we see this. And he would repair and renew the worship of God in the temple for the people according to the word of God. Not based on what I want to do. Not based on how I want to worship God. People all the time, they, they think that you know, God's just some, some being up there that's just going to accept anything called what they call worship. No, there, are, there is prescribed ways of worship, and it must be done in spirit and in truth from our heart. It must be from our heart that we worship God. One of those great kings was Hezekiah. Everybody say Hezekiah. I love the story of Hezekiah. King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4 says, He removed the high places and broke the pillars, the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images and broke in pieces the bronze. Listen to this. You talk about a sacred cow. Broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had. People say, oh, you can't do that. But I'm going to tell you, listen to the rest of the story. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to this bronze serpent of Moses. Remember in the wilderness, the serpents came out, bit the people because they were complaining. Many died. They're complaining about God, complaining about the food, complaining about Moses. And God said, told Moses to... to, Make a serpent serpent out of bronze, raise it up, and whoever looks at it would be healed. And I'll rebuke the serpents. They had made an idol of this good thing. Instead of saying, wow, do you remember what God did like you and I do today? They made an idol. They, they, They let something of value take the place of God in their life. And so... Hezekiah just comes along and says, okay, like a good father would. Just take, I'm going to take away your toys for a while. Hallelujah. And it's never coming back, by the way. I've seen videos where a kid played way too many video games. Way too many. I don't recommend this, by the way. But he just took them all out and ran a mower over all those video games. The kid's screaming. Oh, I felt so sorry for the kid. I mean, understand. I understand. I understand. But look at this. They called it another name, Nehushta. Nehushtan, I think. Yeah. Nehushtan. He trusted 
in God, that is Hezekiah, the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of us need to tear down idols. I think Jen came to me just a few days ago. Pastor Randy, I got a message about idols. We got to tear them down. Can I share in the in the uh, fire in one of the fire and glory meetings? I said yes and amen. Come on Monday, you can share it with us. Hallelujah! If you're not up at the state house, I don't know, but anytime you drop in, you're sharing. Hallelujah! How many understand? Amen. Tear down those things that distract. Those things that cause you to lose your affection and cool your your temperature and your heart for God. Renew the altar of prayer. Let me say it again. Renew the altar of prayer in your life of seeking God and finding Him with your whole heart. Renew that priority of your heart of seeking the kingdom first. Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. God has a hope and a future. Remember Jeremiah, he, he, I have good things for you. Just seek me first. Make me the priority. Make my kingdom the priority of your life. Seek me first. Pray and ask. I'm talking about renewing your devotion. I'm talking about repentance, returning and renewing. Pray and ask God to give you a hunger. See, we can't manufacture hunger. We have to go after God in our own will. But it is He who ignites the flame. You know when the fire of God hits you. It hit me afresh and anew. I try to keep it, but I knew what I was carrying from last year. I knew the burdens that I was carrying. And I had to lay them down and give them to God. And so do you. Let your desire for God And your hunger for God grow in him. Renew your heart and finally rejoice. Everybody say amen. Rejoice. My attitude matters to God. It really does. My attitude and my humility matter to God. You see, desiring God faithfully And faithfully pursuing his will brings great joy. Let me just tell you, I would have never served God for these 40 years had there not been joy that flows like a river from the throne of God. I'm telling you, I have more joy in serving God than I ever had tasted in this world. It can't even be compared to the joy that I have in Jesus and that you have in Jesus. There's no joy in rejoicing, though, without encounter with God and encounter with Him more and more. Encounter occurs when we seek Him to find Him. And most of us, this is human tendencies, we rejoice when the victory occurs. It's easy to rejoice when the victory and the breakthrough happens. But all of us should rejoice in the God of the victory who brings the victory. You should rejoice before the victory, during the trial, and after the trial. I'm going to tell you rejoicing is appropriate. Rejoice in the Lord always, always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, the Bible tells us. The Bible is very clear. To get your joy back, repent, return, renew. The joy of the Lord is a life source. It is a life-giving force. It is an eternal stream from Jesus that is unchangeable, unbreakable, and unstoppable. We have no excuses for not having the joy of the Lord or maintaining the joy of the Lord in our heart. I know you go through trials. Jump in the stream. 
repent, return, renew, rejoice. God is for you. Come on up here, Mike, and worship team. Let's review real quickly the words of Jeremiah. These are the words of God, no less. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I know the thoughts. And God is true to itself. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Do you see your heavenly father this way? To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray. See, that's our job. That's what we do. We may not feel the breakthrough, but you call upon him anyway. You, you begin your fast anyway. You may not have hit the first day, but hit it now. We got two more weeks. Amen. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I promise that I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. This message was sent to Israel while they were in captivity. They had to turn their heart while they were in captivity in order to get back to where they were supposed to be. Stand with me. Bring those lights down, Steve, if you would. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me. Don't let your heart grow cold, not this year, not now, not in this season, not when we see the events of the world, not at this time, not in this new year, no, not ever. Do not let your heart grow cold in any circumstance. I know you'll feel the disappointment. I know you'll go through the hardship. I know you'll experience those things that cause you pain and hurt, but you press through. In my devotional today that I've been producing every day on my Facebook page, and by the way, if you're not following me, you can get it. Randy Rice on Facebook. Please follow me. Every day I'm, I'm posting a devotional for you in this brand new year. And the, the devotional isn't in print, but I hope to put it in print soon. It's called Encourage Your Soul. And today I talked about forgive and move on. Forgive and move on. Don't let unforgiveness cause a root of bitterness in your heart. Oh, you've got to be so careful. Don't let lukewarmness hold you captive. Return to God every day, every night. Speak to him. Look at your heart. Study what's happened. God, is there anything that is going wrong? Am I on the wrong path? Path? Am I off by a degree, God? Because I know in the end, it'll take me far, far away from you. Help me to stay on the path. I want you to make this declaration with me. Say it out loud. And repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank, you thank you for the open door, the open door of, repentance of repentance you offer me. You offer me. Thank you. That I can return with all my heart and find you and refresh my soul today. I will return and I will repent and I will renew my hunger for you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who ignites the flame a fire in my heart for you. And thank you that you will restore the river of joy, the river of love in my heart and strength from heaven will return once again. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, let's give God praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then your kingdom broken lives are made new. Come on. You make us.
snoo.